Jerry, thank you very much, and thank you for bringing me back. I'm very proud to be part of the history that Jerry outlined. And I want to thank Samir and David, who I've known, I guess, as long as I've known Jerry, and my fellow panelists. Um, I also want to give a quick apology to the audience. I was just mapping in my little patch. I'm in between eye surgeries. Um, it helps me focus the one good eye I have, um, but the glare in the room is not conducive to working with one eye, so bear with me. Um, I want to do four things quickly and not take too much of, of, of our overall time. I want to talk about defining the literacy myth. Secondly, I want to say a little bit about my sense of how history and myth inspire in the construction and the now long-term dissemination of the literacy myth. I want to talk briefly about my own historical context at the time. I did a dissertation in the University of Toronto that was the beginning of what became the literacy myth. And a few quick words on the future. <coughs> in an entry in the Encyclopedia of Language and Education, John Duffy and I define literacy myth like this. Literacy myth refers to the belief articulated in educational, civic, religious, and other settings, contemporary and historical, that the acquisition of literacy is a necessary precursor, precursor to, and invariably results in economic development, democratic practice, cognitive enhancement, and upward social mobility. Despite many unsuccessful attempts to measure it, literacy in this formulation has been invested with immeasurable, <coughs> indeed, on ineffable qualities, purportedly conferring on practitioners a predilection toward social order, an elevated moral sense, and a metaphorical state of grace. Such presumptions have a venerable historical lineage and have been expressed in different forms from classical antiquity, through the Renaissance and Reformation, and again throughout the era of the Enlightenment, during which literacy was linked to progress, order, transformation, and control, however contradictory some <coughs> of those elements may sound. Associated with these beliefs is the conviction that the benefits ascribed to literacy cannot be attained in other ways, <coughs> nor can they be attributed to other factors, whether economic, political, cultural or individual. Rather, literacy stands alone as the independent and critical variable. Taken together, these attitudes constitute what I call beginning in the late 1970s, the literacy myth, and for better or worse, sometimes in favor, sometimes in opposition, the phrase literacy myth has stuck in many corners. Um, it's interesting history <coughs> in its own right there. Um, when I came to do the work, it was a very different time than the world today. The influences are different. In fact, I didn't even think of calling it the literacy myth until I came to turn the dissertation into a book. The dissertation had a long-winded dissertation-like title. And so I worried for the next three years, what am I going to call it? I want to call it literacy and social structure, which is what the dissertation was called. And in my dreams one night, the notion of the literacy myth came through. What I realized in the last few years in <coughs> having the good occasion to get to think about my work 30 years after it first came out, a situation that, that in some ways almost brings me to tears to have my words and my work remembered throughout that whole period. I realized that at that time I wasn't thinking very much about myth. The use of a myth is certainly much more conventional than the way I think about mythology today. Um, the use of the term myth also opened the book to many of its critics to say, Graf says all the connections of literacy are fictitious. They're a fairy tale, and that's really wrong. That's not the sense in which I use myth. The sense that I've come to understand that foreshadowed with the book goes more like, like, like this. For the literacy myth, 
history and myth inseparably intertwine. Myth itself becomes a mode of interpretation, explaining or narrating, and a means to communicate that understanding, not unlike reading and writing themselves. This includes recognizing literacy and the literacy myth as ideological and also as culture, and criticizing that ideology and that culture. It also mandates critical exploration of the relationships between and among material reality, social relationships, institutions, policies, expectations, and I also think the basis of modern social theory. All those links are inseparably related. Yet the central critical role of myth is often misunderstood still today. Uncritical, unmediated attitudes about literacy represent quote unquote a myth because they exist apart from and they exist beyond the range of empirical evidence that might clarify the actual functions, meanings, and effects of reading and writing. Like all myths, the literacy myth is not so much a falsehood, but an expression of the ideology of those who sanction it and those who are invested in its outcomes, which includes many of us in parts of our lives and certainly <coughs> say, just about all of our colleagues who sometimes I find get very, very nervous around those of us who want to criticize things like literacy and its impact. For this reason, the literacy myth is powerful. It's also resistant to revision, and which Jerry alluded to that in his opening remarks. Contradicting, contradicting popular notions, myth is not synonymous with the fictive and the false by both definition and I think also by means of the cultural <coughs> work that the literacy myth does. Myth cannot, almost by definition, be wholly false. For a myth to gain acceptance, it must be grounded in at least some aspects of perceived reality. Partial truths, in other words, are not falsehoods, but they have elements of truth with them. Now, a few pages. Um, in, the, in thinking about the 30 years anniversary, I've thought a lot about myth, and I've been often asked, well, who do you read on myth with? And when I think back, to both the mid-70s and the late 1970s when I came up with the title and wrote the book, I'm reminded of a very different kind of influence, the kind of intellectual web and the social web that stimulated me first toward the topic of literacy, which I began with an MA thesis in, in, Toronto in 1971 and grew into a dissertation and then a lot of my book's work the literacy myth reflects <coughs> the social and political currents of the 1960s and 70s much more. To me, it does than reading structuralists, psychostructuralists on mythology. On the one hand, there's the influence of the times. And almost as important is the fact that what we have come to call the new social history, which is now not so new anymore, it was in its early years and it was very exciting for some of us to try and pretend we were scientists going out to try and measure society before we learn the myth inherent in that idea as well. Um, all historical works, of course, are at least part products of their own times, and for better or for worse, this is certainly the case with the literacy. It reflects, and it grew from the unprecedented interest and concern about education's relationships with social inequality what then were seen as declining cities, the place of race in North America and elsewhere, discrimination, poverty, and the radical analysis and prescriptions that accompanied them at that time. Many of us were looking to history to try and explain the roots of problems that came to confront us so, so much in the 60s and 70s. The people many of us read, and my fellow students and my own teachers, were a list that I think we hear much less often than we should today. A list that I'd say began with Paul Whitney and went quickly to a new voice at that time, Alec Ferrer, but also a range of critics of education. In the case of the United States, it went from John Holt to Herbert Cole, John Matuzzo, George Denison, 
and a number of others. In Canada, there was this magazine about schools, and the group that developed around that in Toronto, and who also were, were influences on the book. Um, Toronto was one of the first places in North America that regularly began bringing prayer to North America. These are connections I think we've lost sight of. Um, I am and was an American citizen who went to Canada for a number of reasons at that time, including the Vietnam War, and that too had an impact on the topics we chose and I think the kind of analysis did I try to develop in this book with the Vietnam War overheating the social cauldron, the plight of inner cities protests <coughs> and riots in the streets, riots different than the one encapsulated it in a piece of art down there that did Jerry okay that I look at today. Um, radical politics pivoted around race, gender, and age. The contradictions of democracy's most favorite, how might I say, nation, here I'll say nations, Canada and the U.S., were very real. Those surrounding schooling had very sharp edges. It was no accident that the interests and the methods, sources, and conceptions of historians and historical social scientists were changing altogether at the same time. Researchers probe the roots of then current relationships in new ways with renewed vigor. The seeds of contemporary arrangements and the value of social theory mandated new critical studies. The roots of my own and others focus on literacy. Lay the head. I want to say a final word about where I see literacy myth today and somewhat where I would like to see it go tomorrow. Let's see if there's any echo of this among my fellow panelists. The Literacy Myth, the book, ends with these words. Literacy must be afforded a new understanding in historical context. If its social meanings are to be understood and its value best utilized, the myth of literacy must be exploded. So to say, a much younger Harvey Graff. <laughs> a much older <coughs> Harvey Graff much rare, and one perhaps with less vision of a certain kind, uh, <laughs> ask, is it possible to lose or overcome, to transcend or explode the literacy myth? Or is it our critical task a different one, to understand and mold it for individual and collective well-being and progress? Do we need, do we in fact need to retain the literacy myth? Can the literacy myth be transformed and redirected. Our task, as I see it, is not to disprove or to explode the literacy myth. I don't think that's possible. But to understand it and to reinterpret it to serve more equitable, progressive, and humane goals. The most useful future for the literacy myth depends on increasing its legibility and its transparency. In an age of multiple literacies, and economic decline, we have no choice. The costs of waiting any longer are just too 